Could we all take our seats, please? Aloha, everyone. And another beautiful day in Hawaii, Nate, despite the rain. Liquid sunshine, as we call it here in Hawaii. Uh, let me first start off by um, uh, welcome each and every one of you to uh, our uh, church service this morning. And um, first of all, let's uh, go over the ground uh, rules for keeping us safe and uh, secure. Okay. Uh, if anyone in your household has been sick within the last 14 days, please have them uh, uh, stay home. And uh, thank you for wearing a mask. And if you don't have one, you may get one from the back of the sanctuary. Uh, please sanitize your hands before service. And when going to the bathroom during service, exit and enter at the side uh, at either sliding door in the back of the sanctuary where the doors will be open for you. Uh, only one person at a time may enter the restrooms. However, members of the same family or household uh, are allowed to go together. The drinking fountains are closed and we encourage you to bring your own water. Uh, families are encouraged to sit together while others uh, are to keep social distance of six feet. We love to greet one another with handshake hugs or a kiss or a kiss, but please refrain from doing so at this time. Uh, no offering bowl will be passed around. Offerings may be placed in the back uh, black box marks off, mark offering in the back of the sanctuary or given online. Please refrain from giving cash. Mothers with babies may use the nursery to feed or change diapers. And at the end of the service, be mindful of keeping a so safe social distance and remember to use the backsliding doors or, or the regular front doors to exit the sanctuary and uh, last but not least uh, there are uh, name signs on your chairs be sure to put them uh, back where you found them uh, uh, for your uh, seat, seat assignment for next week okay um, in the back of the sanctuary there are these uh, pink envelopes it's the Sunishikawa week of prayer Hawaii Baptist, uh, Hawaii Pacific Mission, which starts today, September 6th, and continues through Sunday, September 13th. And, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, may I call on uh, Greg Hayashi, please? morning and aloha to all of you this morning. It is good to be here and to see all of you here this morning, even with your mask on. And to those who are watching our live stream, we're glad that you can be here with us online. No matter what your week has been like or how you are feeling this morning, it is always a blessing to be here worshiping together, praying, singing, reading and studying his word. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Will you please stand as we read Psalm 105, verses 41 to 45. <coughs> he opened the rock and water gushed out. It flowed like a river in the desert. <laughs> he brought out his people with rejoicing, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. That they might keep his precepts and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. God's blessing on the reading of his word this morning. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to your throne of grace to declare your loving kindness and faithfulness. We are blessed with your goodness, mercy, and grace for the blessings you give to us every day. Thank you for this time that can we, meet, we can meet here at Central as a body of believers to worship 
and praise your holy name. We pray that the words of our mouths, meditations of our hearts, be acceptable to you. And all God's people said. So, just like last week, we're just going to ask everybody that if you guys um, could, we have a lot of space in our sanctuary. If you are closer than 10 feet to someone, if you could just move to an open area. There's a lot of open seats behind over there. You guys are welcome to kind of move during the time when we sing. And um, So we just ask that you guys do that um, if you guys do sing. My hope is built again.
Good morning, church family. Good morning. It's good to hear your beautiful singing voices this morning. Uh, at this time, we'd like to uh, recite our Apostles' Creed, um, which is an affirmation of the faith that was once for all delivered to us. Uh, so please join me. Um, oh. Okay. All right. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Church, let us bow our heads in prayer. Our Father in heaven, it is indeed a blessing to gather as your church on this beautiful Sunday morning to worship you. You are the eternal creator of all things that were made, and in you all things hold together. You fashioned us in your divine image to represent you and reflect your glory throughout the ends of the earth. All of our earthly needs, delights, pleasures, joys, and satisfactions are only but sun rays that point to your Son, Jesus Christ. But we are all guilty of forsaking you, the fountain of living waters, and turn to idols that could never satisfy. We all have sinned against you in our thoughts, attitudes, motives, words, and actions. Left to ourselves, Father, we are hopeless and helpless, condemned forever under your righteous wrath. But we praise your Son, Jesus Christ, our crucified and resurrected King, who died in our place that we may be forgiven of all our sins be counted as righteous, and be adopted as precious sons and daughters. How can we not cease to sing your praises all the days of our lives in light of what you have done? Father, may we use this time now to confess our sins to you. Father, we lean on your promise that if we confess our sins to you, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we thank you for the privilege of parting with you to bring the lost to Christ until the day he returns and makes all things new. Please continue to use our church during this pandemic to draw more people to yourself. We lift up in particular a Hawaii Kai Church to you and ask you to continue to bless their work and ministry under the leadership of Dan Wong. Continue to use them to reach those in their community with the gospel. We ask you for your same gracious hand to be upon our congregation and leadership here at CBC. We ask that the pastor you bring here would be a faithful shepherd and steward of your word. Father, we ask uh, for healing and restoration in our relationships with one another inside and outside the church. Help us to seek unity as we walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. 
would you please continue to build your church on your word so that we may be unashamed and joyful, living testimonies to your grace in Christ. We lift up those facing any health issues and concerns and ask for healing and restoration, if it be your will. We we'll also ask for your protection and provision for our brothers, uh, Lewis Brooks, Joseph Pulitzer, and Carlton King, who are off the island serving our country. Father, please uh, continue to bless uh, the gospel ministry of the IMB missionaries and pastors in Fukuoka, Japan, including Pastor Shin and Sasagu, the Borg family, and Jack and Prina. Continue to train and equip more leaders at Life Tree and Sawara Church to plant more and more churches to reach the Fukuoka community and beyond with the gospel. Lord and Lord, if it be your will, may you give us the opportunity once again to serve alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ there in the near future. And Father, have mercy on this nation as we are overwhelmed by, you know, the many violent protests and riots across um, our nation that are driven by sinful desires and godless ideologies. Father, please bring healing and peace to this nation that can only come through Christ alone. We thank you for uh, the local, state, and federal government that you have instituted to reward those who do good and punish those who do evil and to protect the freedoms we have. Please continue to give wisdom and discernment to our leaders to lead the nation in righteousness. May you continue to raise up more and more leaders who fear you more than man and who are willing to protect the weak and vulnerable, including the unborn. We thank you for the men and women in the armed forces who continue to sacrificially serve and defend our country. And please protect and provide for them and their families wherever they live and serve. And Father, we are grateful for our brother, Craig Webb, and his wife, Barbara, um, and um, as he prepares uh, to faithfully preach the word this morning. Uh, may your word be a lamp unto our feet and a, and a light unto our path. And may we be not only hearers, but also doers of your word. And Christ, we look to you, our only hope in life and in death. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name and all, all God's people said. Good morning. May we continue uh, to see God's wisdom and how to, how to best use the resources he has provided for us. And we thank God for the ultimate provision of um, the, atoning, the atoning sacrifice uh, for our sins through Jesus Christ, his son. Please stand as we sing the offertory hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy.
possível. Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 118, verses 15 to 24. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the, the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. In light of that, let us sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Let me say, good morning. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, so good to see you this morning. I, I don't know about you guys, but I think about the middle of this week as we're in this, um, this next sort of shutdown thing that we've been in with, our, uh, with Honolulu. Uh, how many of you admit uh, sometime this week getting a little blue about it? Raise, raise your hand, a little discouraged. I want to see it. Right? Just keep them up for just a minute. All right, now I need you to keep them up for just a minute. Uh, Take a minute and look around the room. Keep your hands up. All right. So just about everybody in here. Do you realize that? Uh, that, that includes Barbara and me. We, there was the, the middle of the week. And I know there was, uh, there was one day that I was, I was getting uh, discouraged and overwhelmed. And I tell you that what, what I do if, uh, if I start to get discouraged and overwhelmed or if I have a night that I have a fit in the, uh, fitless, what do you call it, when you can't sleep really well. You know, I don't know what you call it. But when you can't sleep really well, and I had one of those nights, and usually what God will do when I can't is, is he'll, I finally get to sleep, and then he'll get, get me up really early, and he'll say, you need to spend time with me. <laughs> and so I'll get in there, and I'll have extra time with God. And of course, you know I journal, and I write those things out. I write out praise to God. And so I, I was spending a lot of time in praise, and spent a lot of time uh, talking to God about who he is and praising him and his attributes and then moving into a time of thanksgiving. And God gave me just, these, just uh, a couple pages full of thanksgiving, all these different things that I'm so thankful for. And then uh, bringing me into a time of bringing those burdens that I have, whatever was keeping me awake. And I just want to encourage you th this week as we uh, hopefully some of those restrictions will be lifted Thursday. I, I don't think so. I don't think it'll happen. I think they'll make it go longer, but uh, I'll be glad. I'll be glad to be able to go to the uh, hiking or the park or go to the mall. Um, I'm grateful to be able to go jump in the ocean every once in a while and to be able to walk uh, outside. But, uh, but it is. It's discouraging. And as, as we've looked at this passage in 1 Peter and all throughout this letter that Peter's writing, we find that there is great encouragement where we lose courage. And Peter, and this is the, the Spirit of God speaking to Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ, uh, speaks. And he is, this was written down by his cohort. 
And, uh, and so then here it is today as we read it, God is going to be filling us full of courage and hope in the face of our fears. And specifically today, we're going to be looking at this whole issue of Jesus being our cornerstone. So I want, to, I want you to take uh, your scriptures and open to 1 Peter, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, focus on chapter 2, but I want to remind you that uh, as, uh, as we prepare for in a little while, we're going to be taking the Lord's Supper, and I hope you all have one of these. If not, when it's time for the Lord's Supper, uh, our, our, uh, our attendants will be sure to, that you get one of these before we take the Lord's Supper in just a few minutes. But as we prepare for that, we're going to be focusing on, again, as we always do, the gospel of Jesus Christ and who Jesus Christ is. And as Peter uh, writes uh, here in in what we call 1 Peter, we see that he uses a lot of Old Testament imagery over and over again um, to, to show that for us as New Testament believers, as New Covenant believers, that, that uh, whether we're Jew or Gentile, that we are a people of God who have come to possess all the blessings of Old Testament Israel. All that God had promised to them, we are coming to have possession of. And so, so as we look at this, not only do we have these blessings, but we have them in far greater measure. And as, as God's chosen people, we have a new family. <clears throat> we have a new identity. We have a new and living hope in Jesus Christ. And last week, we hit on several of those Old, that Old Testament imagery, the, the imagery of how we're, uh, remember they wore these long flowing robes and, and they weren't made for running or working. And when it was time to work or run, they would gird up their loins, they would pull up those uh, long flowing robes and they would tuck them into their belt and their bare legs would be showing. And it's like us wearing shorts and they'd be able to get out there and run or work in the same way that in the Exodus when they had to get up and leave immediately to get out of slavery in Egypt, they had to gird up their loins and start going as they were delivered from God in the same way we are. Uh, they are the holy people of God journeying through the wilderness, uh, just like in Exodus chapter 12 through 15, where the, the new Exodus redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ who's the true and ultimate Passover lamb. We saw that last week. And we're the people of the new covenant with God's word deeply planted in us. And so as we get to chapter 2, we see this word in scripture uh, a lot of times. You see that very first word in chapter 2, verse 1, where it says, therefore. And you always know that when you see the word therefore, you want to know what it's there for. And it's always referring to what the, the writer had just previous to this, and it's, it's all of this that he has, all about this new identity now that we're under this new covenant, and specifically, I think when, when, when uh, Peter's saying, therefore, he's referring back to verse 22, where he talks about this new covenant that we have, and this new, this new thing that we operate under, this new law, which is the law of love. It is, and he specifically talks about how, in verse 22, show sincerely, sincere brotherly love for each other. So he's saying this, you have this new identity, you're a new family, you're the new people of God, you're under this new covenant, and there's a new way that you act. And so in these first verses here in chapter 2, he starts to mention, he says, therefore, Rid yourselves, and we talked a lot about this when we are looking at Colossians, you remember this? Rid yourselves of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. And he says, like newborn infants, desire the pure milk of the word so that, so that by it you may grow up into your salvation if you've tasted that the Lord is good. So he's, he's saying, listen, there's a new way you act. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because what I want to jump into is what he starts talking about as he, he introduces some, some other Old Testament imagery here starting in verse 4 of chapter 2 where he talks about this, this new temple of God. This, this, he talks about living stones 
and he's going to talk about each one of us, uh, whether you're in here in this room or whether you're watching online live or later on, he's talking about us as living stones who are built on the foundation of the ultimate living stone, the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. So, so listen here. He says, as you come to him, a living stone, he's talking about him, Jesus Christ, a living stone rejected by people but chosen and honored, and, and the, it's also the translation, and precious, precious to God, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting here that, that Jesus is called uh, the living stone. This is not something that Peter is introducing here. This is not something that Peter was you know, walking along somewhere and he's going, oh, I, I like this idea of calling Jesus the, the cornerstone or the living stone. And, and no, this is something that from uh, in, in the Old Testament, there's so many different references to Jesus as the cornerstone. And in fact, Peter's going to quote uh, from those, from both Psalm and from Isaiah. Uh, Jesus, it's also interesting that Jesus himself, and Peter would have remembered this, referred to himself as the cornerstone. He does this in Matthew chapter 21, in Mark chapter 12, in Luke chapter 20. And when, when Peter had been given in Acts chapter 4, when he's doing his great sermon, remember when, when all the people were gathered and people were getting saved there in Jerusalem after Pentecost, uh, Peter was preaching this great sermon, and he had mentioned back then about Jesus being the cornerstone. cornerstone. Now... The fact that Christ is the living stone shows the superiority of Jesus to an Old Testament fixed temple made of stones that were not alive. Stones aren't alive, right? They're they're not. And so he's got this this, uh, imagery here from the Old Testament. He's borrowing from this image of the temple built with stones, and he's trying to help us to understand, listen, in this new reality, you are now the people of God. You're the new family of God. You've been chosen just like the people of Israel were chosen. You've been chosen to be part of this family, and he's saying Jesus Christ is the ultimate cornerstone, the living stone, and for us as believers, we are all living stones in this new temple. It's a whole nother image that he has for us. It's important for us to understand that, that we're part of what he's doing. Look what he says in verse 6. He says, for it stands in Scripture, and he's, he's quoting here from Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. He says, see... I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored, and again, the the word precious, uh, precious cornerstone, and the one who believes in him, listen to this, will never be put to shame. In verse 7, he says, so honor will will come to you who believe, but for the unbelieving, and then he quotes from uh, Psalm 118, this is what Josh uh, read earlier. The stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone. And then he quotes from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14. And a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they disobey the word. They were destined for this. Now, I know in our normal construction, uh, and I know we've got folks in... uh, in our church, they do a lot of construction and renovation and building. Um, but in our modern construction, we don't think in terms of building with a cornerstone. Uh, if you were to build an apartment building, Ernest, you wouldn't use a cornerstone per se. You're going to dig footings. You've got all these things. But in the ancient architecture, all the great buildings were built with a, a cornerstone. 
And there's several characteristics of this cornerstone that was the foundation and everything else was built off of this cornerstone or this capstone or the primary stone that was at the, the corner of the building where they started building it. The cornerstone was always the first one that, it was, that was laid. Uh, and the reason for this is that in this, in this ancient architecture, when they would uh, put this stone in, the rest of the building would be laid out according to the dimensions and how this was laid out. Everything started from this cornerstone. So it was the first one that was laid. The second thing is it had to be the most perfectly cut stone because what the cornerstone would be is what the house or the building would be. And the lines of the cornerstone became the lines of the house. And if the cornerstone wasn't cut perfectly, uh, right angles to the ground, uh, then the house would not be at good right angles. And so where, whatever the cornerstone is, the house is. If the dimensions of the cornerstone are off, the house is off. If the cornerstone is true, then the house would be true. So you start to understand when you're looking at the, this architectural reference that was both in the Old Testament that Jesus care, uh, applied to himself and now Peter is reminding us about. So, so it's the first stone laid. It's the most perfect cut stone. And then the cornerstone had to be uh, the toughest and the strongest stone because if there was any lack of integrity in the stone, if there are any structural flaws or fissures, if it crumbled in any way, the house, the entire house, would be compromised and even lost. And so it was usually the largest stone because of all these reasons. And just as it was described here, it was the most precious stone. It was, this, it was often uh, the early builders would spend as much time finding and preparing the cornerstone <laughs> as they would on the entire building. And there's times that the cornerstone itself was so precious and so costly that sometimes the cornerstone would cost more than the rest of the, the building combined because it was, it was so uh, precious. Uh, it, it was the most expensive part of the ancient building. And, and so all of this background, when Peter says, come to him, to that cornerstone, or, or in the translation that Josh read, the, the capstone, it was rejected by men but chosen by God because it says, whoever trusts in him will never be put to shame. So when it's saying, put your trust in Jesus, when, when Peter is reminding them, and, and remember they, they're talking to this, uh, this group of Gentile believers that were up there in, uh, in northern, what's now northern Turkey. These were Gentile believers that were scattered. He called them exiles. Many of them were under persecution because of their faith. Many of them had other types of suffering that they were going through, uh, fear because of that. And he, he's saying to trust in Jesus Christ is to make him the cornerstone of your life. Basically, what he is reminding us is that for us, when Jesus has become the cornerstone, and he says, we are the living stones, our response, because of Jesus, he's chosen us, he's called us, to, he's made us a part of his family, we shift all of our trust all of our hope, all, and we even turn over all of our fears. We put all of our weight on to Jesus as our cornerstone. Part of this is, you think about up here, I'm very thankful to God to be able to be standing, right? Uh, and the way that I'm able to stand up here is somehow the way that God has created us is that we're able to uh, shift our gravity in such a way and balance in such a way on our two feet. And you see people that can do this on one foot, uh, but on our two feet and balance in such a way that we keep our center of gravity such that we don't tip over, right? 
Uh, I don't know if you've ever done one of those exercises uh, with a group or a team where they, they get in a circle and you're either blindfolded or you close your eyes and you just sort of tip over, right? It's the stupidest thing you'd ever do, right? Why would you do that? Uh, and, and, you know, you're hoping your team loves you, right? Or someone goes, oh, I, she's going to catch him. I'm not going to catch him. Well, what happens is when you do that, basically you have to shift your gravity, right? And, and you basically tip off your, your center of gravity and you fall and somebody else has to hold you up. <laughs> and what Peter is reminding us is that for us as living stones, that our center of gravity for every part of our life as believers in Jesus Christ has to be shifted to put our weight on the cornerstone because he is the cornerstone. He is precious. He is the only one that will not fail. And it's, it's reminding us. He's, he's saying that's why, why we're, we're never going to be put to shame. It'll, he will never fail us. Now, how do we know? How do we know if our center of gravity, our weight, is leaning on Jesus as our chief cornerstone? Well, I tell you, when frustration comes, or when fear comes, or when anxiety comes, that's when we're able to test, what is it that I'm trusting in? Where is it that I'm placing my hope? Where do I find my, my strength and my courage? And, and there's no greater test than we've had than the pandemic, right? There's no greater test to all the things that, that, that we relied on. And as I talked about the things that were frustrating to us uh, this week or the things that made us discouraged, it would usually be something that was taken away from me in terms of freedom or for some people it had to do with health or for some people it had to do with uh, financial independence or having what they needed. And so in whatever case, they were tipped off of their gravity, whatever they were leaning on for their hope and for their courage and for, for their strength. And so whenever we get tipped off of that, whatever we were putting our hope in, it, and, and we get thrown off, and things are out of kilter in our life, what it reminds me of is that I was leaning on the wrong thing. And as a believer, Peter's reminding the only thing that I can rely on is, is Jesus Christ. That's why he called him the precious uh, cornerstone. And even though he says people rejected him, and in the same way that people will reject you, he says, those who lean on Jesus will not be put to shame. Uh, th this week, uh, uh, Barbara and I were uh, watching uh, online, on uh, streaming on our TV, uh, one of the uh, Survivor programs. It wasn't called Survivor. I don't even remember what it was called. It was one of them. And uh, in, this, uh, in this particular one, they take people out and they drop them off in a remote location and they have to figure out how to feed themselves. I guess they got to bring some things with them. They had to make their own shelter, all of these kinds of things. It was just interesting for us watching what they went through emotionally as they got to where uh, they may have been able to get food and that kind of thing, but there were things that they were really had great anxiety about. And we watched this one man that seemed to be doing really well and figuring out how to catch food and all that kind of thing. But there was this one point and I know Barbara thought this was sweet, is that he was just really missing his wife. It was sweet. But then it got a little weird, okay, because he sort of started obsessing over it. And you realize that for this man, all right, it seemed like he did not have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, but that his, the cornerstone in his life was his wife. Now, that may sound good, right? And it may sound sweet, and it may make a good story. But Peter is saying that there are all these different things that you can place your, your trust and your hope in. 
But unless Jesus is your primary cornerstone, whether this is for our church as a church family or for me and my family and in, in my walk with Christ, he says, everything else can fail you except for Jesus Christ. And it's a, it's a reminder to us that it's the only the one who puts their trust in Jesus Christ that will not be put to shame. It, it reminds us, uh, whether this is for believers or for unbelievers, that Jesus Christ uh, can become a, a stumbling block because knowing that for, for, for all of us, uh, it's, not, it's not an option for us of whether or not we will trust Jesus Christ as the cornerstone because either we're going to put all of our hope in him as his chosen ones, or we're going to be stumbling over it for the rest of our life because all of the other cornerstones, uh, the seeming cornerstones, will fail us. We sang earlier, uh, we sang uh, that song, Cornerstone. I've been looking forward to that all week, uh, to, to sing that. And it says it so well, what, what Peter was reminding us of. That in Christ alone, my hope is found. And then it describes, he's my light, he's my strength, he's my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. And if you could have figured out how to sing it, it says, and pandemic, right? Uh, he says, what heights of love, what depths of peace when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm through the confusion, through the fears, through the pandemic, through financial difficulties, he is Lord, Lord of all. And then it reminds us, when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. As Peter is reminding of this, the last part of this passage, he, he brings up a, another whole, whole uh, Old Testament image as he's been talking about uh, the temple and for us as living stones in the temple of God. Uh, he, he says in uh, verse 9, he has a whole other uh, Old Testament image of the priesthood where he describes us. He says, but you... He says, you're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. As we prepare this morning, as we prepare our hearts to, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, I want you to remember that, I want you to think about why when God talks about Jesus as the cornerstone, that he talks about Jesus as this honored, as this precious cornerstone. You think about the, the value and the cost of what it took to make us a chosen race. What it took to make us a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession. It was precious and costly in the same way in chapter 1, Peter talked about the blood of Jesus Christ as the precious blood of Jesus Christ. This was real blood that Jesus shed for us. 
This was real pain that he uh, had in his body. This was true wrath, uh, the wrath of God that was poured out on him so that we could receive his mercy and so that we could receive his grace. And so when we celebrate the Lord's Supper today, we are remembering that why he is precious <laughs> and also remembering that because God saw him as precious and that we've been adopted as his children, that we become part of his family, do you realize now that as his chosen one, as his royal priesthood, as his holy nation, a people for his possession, that now that we are precious to him. We are his precious possession. And that's what we celebrate when we take the Lord's Supper. We celebrate what he has done to redeem us by the blood of Jesus Christ. I, I want to ask you if uh, you would take out your cups and as we prepare uh, for the Lord's Supper right now, we're going to read some scripture. We're going to pray. Um, I, I will remind you that um, if you haven't used this before, there's the clear cellophane. And if you want to go ahead and pull that back now, that'll open up and allow you to have the bread. And we'll wait a moment to open the other. If you just hold that bread in your hand. I'll read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 Paul is writing to the church of Corinth and he says for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you on the night when he Jesus was betrayed the Lord Jesus took bread and when he'd given thanks he broke it and he said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance you notice we always pray because it's there. It reminds us uh, that Jesus gave thanks. We express thanks with a prayer, but also a big part of what we do when we take the Lord's Supper is we're giving thanks. We're remembering. We're proclaiming. This is what I believe, that Jesus Christ gave his body for me. And we're giving thanks to God for what Jesus Christ has done for us. I'm going to ask uh, Ernest if you would stand, if you would just uh, pray and give thanks to God right now. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'll give you a chance to uh, pull off the other part carefully slowly Before I read the part about the cup, I'm going to jump down to verse uh, 27 in uh, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. And Paul was reminding them as they take the Lord's Supper, 
It says, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. And he says in verse 28, let a person examine himself in this way. Let him eat the bread and drink the cup. Forever, for whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body uh, eats and drinks judgment on himself. One of the things that we do as we prepare is we think, we think of the cost and how precious the blood of Jesus Christ is. And how we've come to trust completely put all of our weight on him as the precious chief cornerstone. We recognize uh, that this side of heaven, we still struggle with trusting him. And so we trust in other things. So we ask God to help us and to forgive us and we confess our sins to him. Before we even pray, would you just close your eyes and as you hold the cup that's representative of the blood of Jesus Christ, would you personally thank Jesus for the blood that he shed and would you ask him to forgive you of any way this week or even today that you've been trusting in anything else over him. Greg, would you voice our prayer, please? same way. Also, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. sing this last song, I, I just wanted to re, for us to remind ourselves of um, how unworthy we are um, just by ourselves and how much we have failed and sinned against God. Um, it says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus, by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because, of, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And uh, we, we oftentimes lose sight of who we truly are and As the Apostle Paul um, says in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecute the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So let us continue to echo what the apostles, what they said about Christ and how he truly is our only hope. Without him, we have no hope. 
church, let's continue to, to sing. Please rise and, and stand as we sing this. Simple but yet so true. Yet not I, but through Christ in me.
lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. All that we have is in Jesus. Jesus is our joy, our righteousness, and our freedom. He will lead us through the deepest valley. Not I, but through Christ in me. Amen. Thank you, Craig, for, uh, for continuing to preach about courage in the face of fear. And this morning, about living stones. Church family, we are these living stones being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. In verses 11 and 12 of 1 Peter 2, as living stones, we need to abstain from sinful desires and live godly lives. Our benediction comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. If any need help with anything during the week, please see or call any of our deacons or email the church with your needs. Thank you for being a blessing to each other here this morning. Let me leave a blessing for you as we leave. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. God bless and have a great day in the Lord.